All right, howdy, everyone. Welcome to Book Club on Unsafe Space. I'm Carter Laren, and let me see if I can get other people on the screen. Uh, forgive my boomer moment, because it may take a moment to fix to fix this. <laughs> so hold on for a sec. Let's see. All right, everyone should be unmuted, theoretically, right now. Uh, and there we go. Let's do a gallery view of everyone. All right. Can you guys hear me? And can you? Can I hear you? Speak. Hello. Hello. Hi. All right. There's <laughs> Carrie down there. We have CT and Alex. And I'm going to add some more attendees while Carrie introduces the book. Hi, guys. Welcome to Unsafe Space Book Club. If it is your first time here, we have a small group today, which is just fine by me. I I think Card pointed out we are competing with a very popular ball game. <laughs> I have it on to my left. I'm watching Italy and England right now, and I apologize for those of you in Europe who are... Uh, a sporting event. Yeah. Remember the, remember the time we did the book club during the Super Bowl or something? Yeah. I don't watch yeah. much sports, but I do sometimes watch soccer and hockey. Although, hey, if you are in England, let's be honest. The better game was yesterday. The better teams were yesterday. This is just Italy and England. This isn't really that important. So now that I've offended everyone. <laughs> so today, that went over my head anyway. Today, we're talking about Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Thank you, everybody who's joining us. And if it's your first time here, uh, we just ask that you, if you're not speaking, put yourself on mute. That way we don't hear a lot of background noise. And when you want to say something, make sure to take yourself off of mute so we can hear you. Um, and you can find out more info if it's your first time watching one of our book club videos, you can find out more info about our book club at unsafespace.com on the book club page. It's free to join and participate. And we try and alternate between fiction and nonfiction. So we have a good range of, of things that we're reading that some people are more into one than the other you can join for whatever you like. Carter, can we, I, I just knew nothing about this book, Carrie. I had, I went in only knowing that there was a title that I had heard floating around, and I knew zero about this book. I liked it, kind of. It was also bizarre and absurd to me. <laughs> um, yes. I, there was a, like, it took me until the, it took me for a, wh a while to figure out, like, at first I thought maybe everyone actually is insane, and this is some kind of weird thing where we're, like, people are, are insane and then it, then i kind of finally realized that's not the case that um and i i like the message actually in many ways um but it's also weird to find yourself rooting for yosarian at the end who's kind of not a great person in <laughs> many ways like he's not a he's not much of a hero but he's still the guy that you kind of relate to and root for in the end so i i enjoyed it i'm glad i read it but it was not anything like i was expecting i don't know what i was expecting It's time for someone else to speak now. That's I awesome. absolutely loved it. Uh, I did the audiobook like I usually do, and it was, I laughed out loud, like in several parts, especially Nate Lee's horror uh, when she started going after Yosarian. And like, it was like a comedic horror movie at that point where it was like, oh my God, he cannot escape this woman. <laughs> but then also, like, there were times when I was absolutely shocked at how horrible everything was. And if I th really thought about the comedic moments, even, even Nate Lee's horror, I would go, this isn't funny at all. <laughs> if, it, if I really think about this, and if these were real people, none of this would be funny. This would all be horribly tragic. And that penultimate chapter, like really, I was like, oh my God, it was like being punched in the chest. It was so hard uh, to sit through it, but it was like, it, it's such a good book. It has like such a wonderful balance of comedy and satire and seriousness. I And they are insane, but they're insane because of their situation. And you can't help but be insane when you're in that situation. There was no way out for so many of them. And it was just, being waited to, you know, waiting to be picked off essentially. So I was like, yeah, this is both comedic and crazy. 
Yeah, it wasn't like they were insane, but it was appropriate to be insane given the insanity of the reality that they were living in, right? So it was like, oh, of course you're insane. And by the way, I forgot to mention that, Alex. Thank you. I found it hilarious. I did find it hilarious. Manny, you like you want to say something. Or CT's trying to talk and is muted. I can't tell. Carter, too many people can't unmute themselves right now. They're trying to tell you. <laughs> oh, thanks. See, it's a good thing Alex is here. She's actually reading the, the chat. Uh, why can't you unmute yourself? All right, hold on for a second. I'm sorry. I was wondering, like, this is a weird conversation. No one's jumping in. Uh, try unmuting yourself now. Oh, yay. great. Yay. yay. No. Okay. We were all like, Carter. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> I was really confused. I'm like, why is everyone so quiet? Gary <laughs> usually speaks. Manny's here. What's going on? Why is it just me and Alex? <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, based on something you said at the beginning, Carter, about enjoying the themes of the book. Like, what do you, what were your takeaway themes of the book? I have, I've, I would like to hear what you think they were before I say what I oh that well that's I a good question so w when I say theme I, I really mean uh there's this there's this I I guess you could call it cynicism but there's this kind of stark realization of the brutality senselessness and and injustice of war generally and that there's um it kind of exposes blind patriotism as this really not anything noble and and it exposes the kind of hypocrisy of many of the people involved in wars i do think it was clearly over the top right not every general and colonel is that horrible the, these were these were obviously archetypes designed to point out bad characteristics in probably people who have you know generally are, are normal in other ways but uh the kind of absurdity of the situation I, I, I'm anti-war generally. I think war is a horrible idea, and I think patriotism is very dangerous when it's just blind obedience. And so I kind of liked the exposure of, like, this is actually insane, and a normal person actually will look insane in an insane situation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. If I may coming from reading this book as a cold war veteran i i laughed and laughed and and the first thing i thought was i'm going to have to research heller's biography to see if he served in the military because i was looking at this as an enlisted person going this is every freaking officer stereotype and character that i have ever encountered in all of my days not even kidding and i was air force so this this was the army air corps that, you know, of course, on the Air Force. And I'm sitting here going, I've met that pilot and that pilot and that pilot and that pilot. And then there's Milo. And I'm like, okay, that's the, that's the entire supply core right there. I mean, <laughs> I'm just like, what in the absolute hell is going on here? Is this, I just, I couldn't believe it, reading the entire thing, which is why, of course, I have all of these tabs going on with, um, okay, this is government, this is military, this is government, this is exactly life as we see it, and so much of it points to what we're living right now, even. There's so much that is true to what we're going through right now, and it's like, okay, Heller, did you have a crystal ball or something? Because Was and, he in the military? Do I don't know. You researched I don't know. Was, I, was I did not. I didn't get around to researching him, but I'm like, somebody's got to find out if he was, if he served, because there's no way in hell he was not a veteran or was close to veterans to be able to write this because this is just, yes, they're caricatures, but holy cow, holy cow. Yeah, he was in the U.S. Army Air Corps, it says, and he was, he was sent to the Italian front and he flew 60 combat missions uh, as a B-25 bomber, so... Okay. Yeah. Uh, and be, yes, our bombardier. So yeah. Um, Char, but, what did you think? What did you think when you say that, that so much of it applies to today? Because I think one of the things I, I thought that is very applicable, probably always, always, is just this 
the the what uh, there's there's a good phrase to this I can't remember what it is but it's basically like the quiet tyranny of bureaucracy of just boring like there's so much bureaucracy here pointless <laughs> you know? well one of my notes I put in here is craven leadership mm-hmm. and it's where let me see here the chaplain is talking to Colonel Cathcart. And Cathcart says, that's right, the colonel explained exuberantly, the sooner we get some casualties, the sooner we can make some progress on this. And I'm like, it it made me think back to my days as an enlisted person serving over in Mildenhall and they're they're handing me a bucket of white paint and saying, we've got, you know, know, muckety mucks coming in, go paint those rocks. Is that the best use of my abilities and times that you spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars training me to do? Really? Okay, I'll do it. Go paint the rocks. It's all about show. Yeah. Can I ask you another question? That's the part. Real real quick. All about show. That's the part of you're mentioning the the chaplain when he's telling the chaplain we need to have prayers. We need. We want to have (gasps) prayers. Yes. But. But it's, you realize it's just for show. He's like, if it'll get me in the newspaper, then I want to have prayers. And maybe they'll do a story on us for having the the prayers. The same with those blasted letters that said, dear sir, madam, or Mr. or Mrs. You know, we are are so sorry for the possible death, loss, dismemberment, or, you know, POW of your son, daughter, sister, brother, cousin, aunt, uncle, dog. I'm like, what the hell? That's not what we do, but it was just so over the top because that is just the, you know, Heller did that to show America the ridiculousness of what some of these idiots will do for their own, their own selves. You know, just like, um, what was his name? Stiskoff or something, you know, the parade master being promoted over Cathcart and he knew nothing. He knew absolutely nothing, but we're going to have parades on Saturdays. Why? You're in a theater of war. Why are you having parades? And his wife, Shyskov's wife, that was amazing. Oh my God, yes, yes, yes. Has anyone um, seen Blackadder? Because I realized that I really watched a lot of Blackadder when I was a kid and I hadn't, I'd kind of like inappropriately young seen the film of Catch-22. And like reading the book again, I was like, wow, um, these kind of images came back from, from the film. But Blackadder, which is about British soldiers in the Second World War. Actually, I think it might be in the First World War. Um, it kind of really borrows heavily. So it's kind of, um, yeah, just military cravenness and, um, you know, your own station. Um, but yeah, I, th- I, I love that detail of the, d- the actual letters being just the form. No actual detail. It was just the format, which kind of shows... And it was weird because it was, I was really enjoying it being really, really hilarious at the beginning. And then by the end of it, it's really sad because, you know, the, because it's such a long book as well, you get the characters do kind of start to feel real and you feel kind of sad for like the realizations that Yosarian is finally having about like everything that's gone through. There were, that's a Blackadder goes forth, by the way. Um, yeah. That's the version. But um, I, there were a couple of things where he kept casually mentioning something that was probably going to happen that I didn't realize was probably going to happen because it was just so ridiculous. Like, like oh, Hungry Joe, the cat keeps sleeping on his face and Chief White, Half Oat, keeps talking about wanting to die of pneumonia. And um, oh, the fact that uh, Doc Danica kept faking his flight hours and how all these things ended up being kind of important like it's casually stated that chief white half oat dies of pneumonia and i was like holy shit or also he has that point where he talks about how they kept kicking him off kicking him and his you know his tribe off land over and over and over again and when he's in the colorado base and they find oil and then they kicked him off like you learn that later that they kicked him off and he kept doing those like little subtle things and so like when he keeps bringing up Snowden over and over and over again, I, and I, I kind of got insensitized to it, which I think is his, his 
point is that some of these things you become desensitized to so that when it finally comes out, like you're not prepared for it. Um, and I, I think that's like one of the things he does really well is like burying the lead, like just, you know, slowly slipping things in under cover until like, holy crap, I can't believe that happened. You know, I, I feel like he did that a lot throughout the book, but n- never in a point where I got tired of it. It, it felt to me like a kind of uh, a narrative that was like PTSD flashbacks, kind of it just returned back to the same scene glimpses of it and then eventually you get the full detail of it um sorry are you done uh, are, no, you, are yeah. you still going are you still okay um so i'm cheating a little bit because i read this last year um but uh i read it just i just picked it up um what struck me about the book so i'm a little hazy on it i'm sorry but what struck me about the book was this was um i, I had it lying around and the reason i uh, picked it up was because I, I finished all the nonfiction that um, I started reading in the past few years because the world is insane. And, uh, but I picked up uh, Catch-22, like, just because I needed something else to read. And I was struck by, first of all, like, how good it was. It was very, very good. Um, and I was, and I think Alex's point was very um, uh, insightful uh, about insensitizing you. Um, how he takes you on that journey. I mean, everybody is saying how well it was. It starts off as an absurdist humor, almost something like vaudevillian, um, like the Marx Brothers. And then it goes into, uh, uh, you know, this pathos and uh, and things that seem so crazy, like like the horror hitting, um, what's his face with, with her shoe. Um, and they keep bringing that up. Like, oh, there's a real story there. Um, you know, um, but some some things that were ridiculous to the end, like, okay, I'm, I'm a hazy, but there was the guy who died, but he didn't really die. He just sort of disappeared and then he came back later, but we were all really sad that he died. What was his name? Sorry. Or, that was Or. Or, yes, Or, that's right. Um, I thought he was, uh, you know, I thought that was like, I mean, that was sort of like the, absurd, the absurdity that was happening at the beginning of the book. Um, the fact that he actually came back well, after like we were all we'd all mourned him um, all us readers uh, and uh, but uh, the last thing I want to say um, is something I think I mean anybody who, who watches on safe space probably thought this when they read the book is that is that part where where everyone this goes back to what uh, CT was saying what uh, that part where everyone is like forced to like, like say the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and, and they just keep adding stuff on, you know, every time they want food, every time they want to use the bathroom, every time, like anything, right? Um, when, I, when I read that part, I was like, oh my God, this is like the culture where we're going through right now. And, and this is like beyond just um, bureaucracy. It, it, you know, it was literally like the culture war. And, um, and then a, a few months later, uh, Brett Weinstein and Heather Hyen put out a clip from one of their Dark Horse podcasts where he read those pages and he said, this is what's going on now. So if you guys oh, might wow. want to check that out, that uh, there's a clip of it. Um, uh, I could find it and put it in the chat probably, but I was like, I felt so validated because I was like, oh my God, I was thinking that thing when I just read that book. And uh, so Brett Weinstein, he says, like, whenever I come across this, I just say, um, give me eat. <laughs> or, <laughs> right? And uh, he's like, I just say that and then I'm good to go. So, but I felt that part was like, wow, that's like, Heller was so, you know, such a talented writer. He did the absurdity, he did the pathos. Uh, it, it's a really good book. You know, you're reminding me of something when, when uh, the part that I underlined here, when mm. uh, Yosarian gets promoted, that mm. the whole conversation about promoting him, I really thought was uh, relevant today. To today, Colonel Corn is talking to Colonel Cathart. They're they're like deciding what to do with him, and he, they say, Colonel Corn says, "You know, that might be the answer to act boastfully about something we ought to be ashamed of. That's a trick that never <laughs> seems to fail." I just, I just really, I just really loved that one. 
I really thought that's happening a lot on social media now, definitely. Yes. Can I ask someone about, um, maybe CT can and uh, talk about this because you were in the military. Uh, my, both my grandfather, grandparents were in uh, World War II. And one of them, he never referred to this as Catch-22, but one of them did describe to me his frustration with basically, I guess, in hindsight, he was talking about Catch-22s where they would, they, he was in the Navy and they would take people in, the psychiatrist would take people into the Navy when they wanted to like move people around from one spot to another or, or get rid of them. And they would say things like, this is according to my grandfather, they would say things like, well, do you like green grass? And if your answer was yes, they would be like, well, you shouldn't be in the Navy. You should move you, right? You should move you. <laughs> and if the answer was no, it would be like, what kind of person doesn't like green grass? There's something wrong with you. It was this, no answer was correct. And everything, like no matter what you did, there was no way out. Is that, I hadn't really connected those two until, you know, with Catch-22 until I read the book. Is that, was that accurate? Did you feel like that in the military as well? Um, my experience was different because it was obviously when things were a little bit more tightened down um, and it was Cold War. Um, but yeah, <sighs> I went in under Reagan, and then shortly after that, um, Bush won. And then as I was getting out, it was Clinton. So think about that dynamic, but, <clears throat> excuse me. But yeah, there was a lot of catch 22. Um, there was always an unwritten don't ask, don't tell, for example, okay. Um, it wasn't official until Clinton, but, Nobody really cared, but if you did and somebody told on you, then it was, are you, aren't you, do you want out, do you not want out? I mean, you know, and then if you tried to get out under being not straight, trying not to get you guys in trouble, um, then it, mm. you know, then people would, would, those who tried to get out for that reason, it, well, why do you want out? Why'd you come in? You know, so that was that kind of catch 22 while I was in. But, you know, when I first found the, the first example of catch 22 described in the book, I was like, yeah, this is this is typical modus operandi for just government in general. Uh, whether it's are you crazy or um, you know, medical or just anything, you know, it's always. If you if you say you're crazy, well, of course you need to go be flying missions. But if you are afraid, then of, then of course you should be flying missions. What? <laughs> <laughs> Only sane people should be, uh, should be afraid of dying, but I'm afraid of dying. Well, of course, so go fly your missions, but I don't wanna die, you know? I, well, of course, I, it just, it made no sense. And that's just the way it works. And. I don't know. It, it's a circular reasoning that that I think is very applicable today. And for anybody who's just watching and maybe hasn't read it, it it's that it's where if you, you can be grounded, you don't have to fly if you're crazy. And all that's required is that you tell them you're crazy. But if you tell them you're crazy, then that, that's evidence that you're actually sane. Because <laughs> you it, it's, it's like the it's like the white fragility trap, the Kafka trap, you know. You either, you either agree to and confess that you have white fragility, or if you say that you don't have white fragility or you don't believe in it, then that's evidence of white fragility. Like there's no way out of that trap. <laughs> it's just, it's just, I don't know. There was another part in there too, where it was defined, catch 22 was defined as a, oh, I know they said you, it, it, uh, you can't read it. It's illegal. It made me think of a uh, Chris Cuomo saying you can't read the, WikiLeaks emails. It's illegal. Only we can read them and tell you what they say. <laughs> when they go to, when he goes to Rome and um, they're, all the people are talking about Catch-22 and they've kind of, and this Yossarian's like, oh, what, how do they know about it? And they said that they came in and they told everyone Catch-22 and the old woman sums it up as they have a right to do anything we can't stop them from doing. So it's basically might is right at the end of the day. Who, who's ever, whoever is on top, kind of get summarized down like that. But the thing about like the insanity thing, it's it 
I think it's kind of, it's a weird thing with believing that you're insane or noticing that you've got symptoms of mental illness. Once you've had, then psychiatrists will say like, oh, you've got insight. So you're obviously not that, that bad. I kind of experienced that a lot with like how people were feeling, especially Yosarian, of course, like that kind of loneliness of knowing this is an insane situation, but you have, you can see that it's insane, but there's actually no way to help you. Well, one thing that kept happening is that someone would tell someone else they were insane. And then later on, that would be reversed. Like very early on in the book, Clevenger is telling Yosarian he's insane. And like, sometimes Yosarian is telling other people they're insane. And uh, like, he's, he tells Orr he's insane, but it's obvious that Orr has a plan. And, you know, the last chapter with Orr, he's like, are you sure you don't want to fly with me? You should fly with me, fly with me, please. He's basically telling him, if you fly with me, you will get out of here. And he's, Yosarian is so sure or is insane because of stuff like the crab apples and the <laughs> chestnuts in his mouth that he, he does, he's not hearing him. Uh, so uh, the fact that they keep discounting each other because they're insane and then something like Mick Watt killing Kid Samson, Arfi killing the um, young woman, and uh, those are really truly insane acts, psychotic acts that probably should have been caught beforehand. Not just, you know, oh, they needed to be grounded, but they, they're they literally going insane to the point where they're committing murder and no one seems to pay attention to that. They're so intent on having the most flight combat missions out of any un unit that they're not real, they, the upper management does not realize how they are essentially uh, killing these people, killing all their humanity. And um, it's really horrible because then they, none of them trust each other. And to some extent that's uh, valid, <laughs> what with Arfi, <laughs> uh, but it's pretty, and what Midwad did, but it's pretty awful. And um, I, I don't know, it's just so terrible to see that that's what happened to all these people. Yeah, one of my favorite parts is when like, or one of the most, like, darkly favorite parts, like, deliciously horrible parts, is when uh, Arfi kills the woman, and Yosarian is there saying, they're going to come arrest you, because obviously, in a sane world, they would arrest him, and the cops come, and it's Yosarian who's getting arrested, because <laughs> he doesn't have papers to be in Rome. It's just... <laughs> and Arfi's fine. He shows up later, like, nothing ever happens to her, Arfi. Yeah. You don't have a pass. <laughs> In fact, Arfie's going to like testify or write a, a statement to damn Yosarian if they want him to. Like, and, and they're like, oh, he, right. and he's an upstanding gentleman in this situation, unlike you, Yosarian. It's just, it's insane. <laughs> I do think that there is kind of from the beginning, he's kind of signaling out some kind of complete psychopaths and some who are just going mad because the situation they're in and Arfi is one of them because he talks about being in at college and like raping that those two high school girls and so there was a kind of indication there's some of these people who are evil and will are just climbing and they they don't have any empathy at all and there's some that are just yeah flawed or you know more like schizophrenic or, or, or becoming damaged by the situation they're in and it is kind of a hero story in the end because we don't know what happens to Yasarian. But so we really he, want him to meet Orr, right? And we're and I I think it's so great that Orr had this it turned out to be this mastermind, right? Uh, yeah. and and we really all kind of want Yasarian to it's weird because at the beginning I was not rooting for Yasarian at all. I thought he was kind of a despicable person, but by the end I'm like, you're the best one of the lot. Like I hope you make it to Sweden. <laughs> Did you guys well, be left with a hopeful feeling? That's something I was going to ask. Was uh, because you're you're in a book that is is dealing with a lot of things that seem relevant today, and down is up, up is down. Things are done just for show. It doesn't matter if you're guilty of something or not. They will find way people to say that you're guilty, and and then at the end, and and the and there seems to be sort of uh, this. I wanted to I wanted to read more about this to um, CT and I did it I wanted to read about Heller because I was thinking I think he's 
he's probably agnostic or atheist. And so, but, but does he, he still, I still finished the book with a sense of hope. And I was wondering what other people thought about that. I, I just want to say, but um, just quickly, I, Heller strikes me as like an old school left wing, you know, guy, like this was written in the sixties. So he's like old school uh, left wing, not new left, but you know, maybe activist left um, in the sixties. Um, but we can like a Noam back. Chomsky. Yeah. Yeah. You say that. Yeah. We could go back to Carrie's point. I'm sorry for that. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I, I was agree. when I, the book, the book itself, it's <laughs> at first it was a hard, hard to follow because it didn't seem like it's chronological and there's so many characters and I'm like, and then they would repeat conversations and they repeat, they say the same thing back. It was almost like they weren't even hearing each other. You had this cor- colonel, colonel talking to the general and, or the, the back and forth and they were saying, oh, this. And then the other one would repeat the words back like he was saying it. And you're like, man, these people are crazy. That's what I was thinking. But, but it annoyed uh, me yeah. at first, Manny. It was like, what is? I mean, <laughs> I, I couldn't, I couldn't. I was trying to set myself like, where, where, where are we in the story? Because it was not in chronological order for at least part of it. Eventually, you start following it when you start thinking about the missions, how many missions you have to do, and it sort of helped a little bit in terms of following, you know, where you were, but like uh, CT was saying, it exposed like how selfish everybody was because everybody was doing things for their own particular reason. Not really for the main reason of whatever, you know, we're at a war or war two, whatever. It was more because, oh, I want to do this. It's going to benefit me. And they were all looking for their own personal interests and the leadership, the, the, the higher ups, the reasons they would do things were so ridiculous the decisions they would make and they really didn't care about anybody below them or i mean that's i think what the point was that he was trying to show in that in that analogy there but uh you know just just Arian was probably the only person or one of the few that you could really get to understand better because he was the main character um and um but i when at the end he's trying to get his uh well, he obviously wants to leave. He's been trying to leave and they don't let him because every time they're, he's getting to the number of missions to be able to leave, they increase him another spy. So he's like, well, this is crazy. And he, he, he's trying to get out of it, but he can't until he gets that uh, deal with, with the two colonels who hate him. Uh, sort of like a deal with the devil, right? They're saying, well, you'll have to do this and then we'll let you go back to the U.S. And sort of he was compromising his own, his own, uh, his own integrity, I think. And, that, and that's how it ends up. And well, in the end, then he, he decides not to go against his own character. Yes. Right. I, I like love the relationship that. between him and the priest or the, the pastor for that reason, because he's an atheist and the pastor is obviously not an atheist. But the pastor's rooting for him to like have some integrity and like do so- there's like they share some kind of understanding of the crazy immorality that surrounds them, even though they might not really be sure what the right answer is. They kind of know that yeah. integrity matters in some way and they're on the same page there. Yes, um, I didn't. I enjoyed that. He basically did, you know, that Bible verse about what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but to lose his soul. That was the choice he made at the end. He could he could have done the deal, accepted the deal, and all he would have to do is what? What Alexander Solzhenitsyn talks about, speak lies. He would have mm-hmm. had to say, I support these two colonels. I support uh, everything they're doing and increasing the number of flight missions constantly. And at the end of the day, he decided not to do that. There was a line I really liked, let me see. Uh, this is why it left me feeling hopeful because I felt like it left us with something like a moral to the story or a way of being. It's like, this is a good way of being. Yeah, it was uh, hopeful at the end. I, I agree with that. Yeah, he said, uh, by the way, while I'm looking up this quote, I like, at the beginning, I didn't like this book for a while, the first few chapters. Yeah, cause it I, was I, tough. I, it was tough to care about the characters and the, the humorous style of writing that I grew to appreciate. I didn't like it at first. I was like, oh, someone's a bit full of themselves 
Actually, wait, you know <laughs> what? Wait, like... I, I was confused at the beginning, and I didn't like the chaotic nature of it yeah. as well. But jumping around afterwards, I think it yeah. was exactly the right thing to do because yes. it gave me the feeling of not knowing which way was up, and that's the feeling he wanted us to have mm. because yes. that's how it felt to be there. So afterwards, I was like in love with it as a technique, but it was like disorienting at the beginning absolutely mm -hmm. and, and when I, he's like major major and you're like what is major major you know and colonel yeah. corn i love that <laughs> the, <laughs> i i figured out like in the first chapter that it was satire and satire always has this like crazy not really organized seemingly disorganized structure like kingsley amos is like that too so i was like oh okay i i knew what i was getting into like immediately i was like oh it's gonna be crazy okay <laughs> so i was like i'm good to go okay absolute true story not lying but i did serve with a lieutenant major <laughs> major ranger <laughs> <laughs> i love it uh okay we have a super chat i just want to read this because it it eric o'sullivan gave us 10 bucks thank you sorry and he's talking about what we're talking about he says as to humor and tone, I feel that Heller's Catch-22 shares a vibe with his contemporaries, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. and something like Slaughterhouse-Five. Snowden's secret was, in the end, he spilled his guts. Bad joke. <laughs> no. Guys, yeah. when I first saw so Snowden's name in there right underneath, um, oh gosh, I've got to find it because I was just like flipping completely out when he's with all of these crazy things, you know, how was Trump at Munich? And then he's talking about, you know, uh, where are the Snowdens of yesteryear? I'm sorry, guys, call me a conspiracy nut, but I was flipping completely out. Yeah, it's, 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 there's some cool coincidences like that, that were like, yeah, I, I saw the word Snowden and it was hard for me to get past that it wasn't Edward Snowden for like, it took me a little bit to get past that. Yeah. There's, a, there's another quote I want to read about. Uh... Can I read real quick, Carl? Let me read that quote oh, yeah, I really yeah, like ahead. at the end. Oh, you found it? This, okay. this, I part, this part just this made it for me. He says, um, you know, he's basically talking with Danby about whether or not he should take the deal. And, and Danby says, it's a way to save yourself. And he says correctly, it's a way to lose myself, Danby. You ought to know that. And Danby says, you could have lots of things you want. And he says, I don't want lots of things I want. And then he says, God damn it, Gam Gamby, I've got friends, Danby, I've got friends who were killed in this war. I can't make that deal now getting stabbed. But anyway, he's basically saying, I'm not going to sell my soul. I'm not going to yeah. lie. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that part. Um, I, there's just, just another thing I was thinking about with respect to how just quote justice is dished out nowadays. And he, at the beginning, I don't know what chapter this is, but at the beginning, um, this is with Clevenger, but of course it happens again later on with his sorrowing at the end. So it's kind of a little bit of foreshadowing, but there's this, there's a couple sentences here that says, the case against Clevenger was open and shut. The only thing missing was something to charge him with, which just feels like so perfect for today's culture. Yeah, and the whole thing about the signing of the, the the forged signatures and who started it and why it was all being done, like it was all complete incompetence, but they had to just be competent in finding someone to blame for it. And so they had to have like a good victim um, to pin everything on. Um, yeah. I and also loved how people picked up on it and multiple people were forging Washington Irving, like, I like how it just kind of like, there's a meme that happened, right? Yossarian started a thing and it, it kind of grew beyond him. I, that was awesome. The underlying theme to that is the hyper-focus on something absolutely irrelevant to what's going on and having multiple, you know, CID officers trying to find the culprit of course, Major Major using it so that he can, you know, avoid doing paperwork because he's just a big old giant chicken shit. But, uh, you know, all this hyper focus on trying to find the culprit, even going after the, the pastor, for that matter. And. And, oh, gosh, and of course, his his subordinate who just left a horrible taste in my mouth, but, um, you know, nothing against atheists, but good grief. That was just no, entirely he was horrible. too. 
I mean, you know, but that was just, I mean, that was just, you know, too funny, but um, you know, the whole hyper focus on totally meaningless things, which is still a common thing in the military theme in the military, unfortunately. I mean, you know, there are so many things that are so wrong with the military now that are in the news that we know about. And yet they focus on absolutely unnecessary things like, oh, I don't know, CRT, but we can't solve other problems like veteran suicide and military sexual trauma. But I digress. Yeah, it's just um, like having logos, rainbow logos for every company that and not really solving any of the problems? Yeah, well, uh, number one, to be fair, it's six year to it, whether the army was focusing on what they need to focus on or not, you know, the activists would do that. So, but I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, CT. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask um, anyone, because I read this a long time ago, right? But um, one thing that amused me, um, but was also like sort of like horrible was that guy uh, who was like in the body cast and and they just kept switching like the, the pipe going on you know, one end and coming up the other when one got full. Like, what, what, what do you think like was the, besides the fact that, you know, oh, this guy's horribly injured and nobody really cares in the hospital because they're so overworked. Besides that, you know, like, like the guys, like, do you think there was like some sort of like commentary on you know, uh, I don't know, like life, everything in number 42 or whatever, like you guys. Uh, I felt like, like it was a representation of how they view, uh, they viewed the soldiers just as machine parts that were just kind of like, just like, they're just a thing to be tended. There's not, they're not human. Um, and there's just like an input and output and they, you know, they're put the right inputs and outputs or whatever. They're, I, I viewed it as like a, just a, exaggeration of the dehumanization uh, but i don't i don't beyond that i don't have any great insights what about anyone else yeah i think it's something for, i got that feeling like it could that you could um it was about like the lack of the subjectivity of of the actual the soldiers involved so it doesn't matter what goes on inside them emotionally spiritually mentally they're just out, they're just exteriors and they're kind of horror that like, they have this kind of, the other soldiers have such a ir, irrational horror of of him. It's kind of, maybe they 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 sort of see that's what they're really like. Um, and there's like this kind of hole, the gaping hole and they like the horror about looking in, can you actually see if, if there's anyone inside there? So I think that was something to do with like the unknown of like the other subjectivity or something. But I didn't. I didn't kind of twig until the the second time that he sort of popped up, and they were thinking he was the same one, or or they didn't know if he was the same one or not. That's I, that's super insightful, actually. I like yeah. the, the hollow shell uh, thing. Yeah. That's great. That that's was, a great that, insight. That was deep. Yeah. Thanks. It's like I mean, when they had uh, Yasarian impersonate the other soldier, and there was a line in there. I can't find it now, but it was something like about how one dead soldier or a live soldier is just the same as any other mm -hmm. they basically I, I can't find it but they you know they ask him to impersonate the guy who died because his family's coming to visit mm -hmm. and they don't want his family to know that he passed away the night before and but his and family the, yeah. knows too like, yeah <laughs> yeah they do but they play along yeah they yeah. do they're like oh he's, he says his name is john ma like, <laughs> you ain't yeah. <laughs> yeah and i'm sure my experience colors a lot of this but um there was quite a, a a long running theme throughout here of commentary against military slash veteran medicine that spoke volumes and uh being someone who relies solely on va for health care i can say that um some are good, some are bad, and some are absolute shitholes. Avoid them at all costs and seek out healthcare in Nigeria if you are <laughs> associated with one of those shitholes. Um, but it, it, I just, you know, uh, you know, like I see, I see two. How many am I holding up? Yeah, you know, I see one of, you know, oh yeah, we cured him. I'm like, what in the hell, really? Yeah, you know, but because it's so over the top, it goes to show how absolutely inept it used to be 
Currently, active duty military health care is not near as bad as it once was because they actually have qualified individuals in there. Um, but at one point in time, yeah, it, it was almost like that. What about the psychology uh, chapter? Oh my God, like he wouldn't even hear Yosarian when he said his name was Yosarian. And then like, he's like, oh, I'm going home. And he's like, no, he doesn't think you're Yosarian. He's sending someone else home. And it was like, oh God, that, I mean, that was such a <laughs> slap in the face. <laughs> yeah, and see, that was, that was a testament with that. And Dr. Danica, that was a testament to the paperwork rules because we have the dead man in Yosarian's tent Okay, mud. I don't know what his rank was. And then we've got Dr. Danica who died with, okay, McWatt while he's standing there alive. And then we've got the, you know, Yosarian when they're playing musical beds, Yosarian and Dunbar playing musical beds. Okay, well, Yosarian is seeing the shrink. The shrink has somebody else's chart and he's going, no, you're not Yosarian. You're this guy. And so that's the guy that goes home for being insane, even though it's Dunbar's dream that Yosarian's faking. I mean, you know, but it's the comedy of it's the paperwork rules. This is what the paperwork says. Mud never checked in through the orderly room, so he didn't die. Doc was on the manifest, so he did die. Uh, the paperwork rules. It actually feel kind like of reminds me of um, in... Uh, the Dune mythos, the, the Butlerian Jihad happens because a computer gets confused and gives a woman who's there for a birth an abortion, because that's what the program says. And it's like, you're as bad as a bad program as human beings. And <laughs> that's how it feels. I feel like anyone who wants the government to solve complex problems should read this book and take it to heart because <laughs> it's such a great, I love the delicious ineptitude of everyone here. And it, frankly, I thought it was way over the top. The fact that, uh, CT, the fact that you're saying, ah, oh, it's pretty much how I view, <laughs> viewed all the officers <laughs> makes it even better for me. Can I, uh, uh, briefly, somebody in the chat on, in the live chat, it wasn't a super chat, so I can't. I can't find it. It's not highlighted, but they were saying something about, we just need to hang on to 2022. Uh, and I wasn't sure what they were talking about in there, but it made me think of the, of them increasing the number of flight missions necessary to be sent home. It's sort of, we, we, we've hit that. Remember when it was two weeks to flatten the curve and it's like, just hang on for two weeks guys. And then, and you reach this point where it, it kind of, it's kind of humorous. It's darkly humorous that there are people who still think, that this next one, okay, we've got the gamma and the beta and whatever, the delta, and they're all coming. And, you know, just whatever the government says, there are some people, no matter what they say, and no matter how many times they repeat themselves and and they go back on their word and change the rule. It's like uh, in 1984, you know, the chocolate rations have increased in price today. And it's just, just kind of, they'll just go a lot. There are some people that will just still go along with it, though. You know, who would be like, so the okay. Osorian's the guy who rips his mask off and is like, I'm done. Two weeks are up. I'm done. Two weeks are up. I'm done. It's been two weeks for a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And then by the end, it's like with Milo and his um, uh, cotton chocolate, like by the end of the book, they're actually eating it. He manages to make them eat it. They've gone. So it's kind of like, you know, I don't know. It reminds me of, I don't know if it's like a sci-fi book where they have, is it Silent Green? Was that film? Mm. Yes. They end up like eating, you know, people. It's like, it's like in the UK, you know, clapping for the NHS workers or, you know, when there's no actual cases going on. It's kind of like that, parades and stuff. Diane, there reminds was, that was a great part. And there was a great line in there. I just want to highlight where when he was showing him the chocolate covered cotton and, and you're sorry, and was like, they're not going to, you can't, they won't swallow this. Like, I love that he chose that expression, swallow. Oh, they'll swallow it. Like, like yeah. they'll, they'll swallow it. They'll go along with it. it. It reminds me of what happens sometimes. Well, it happens in real life. And like you're saying in some other examples, when you look at the end result, if you looked at it after you analyze it, like they're never, nobody would ever do something like that, but it goes in little increments. Like you, when you look back, you're like, how did we end up here? Because nobody, if you thought about it, we should ever be in this situation. And then you see that the powers are doing these little increments that step by step, you start getting closer to that. And, and if you don't realize it and you're just staying in there and just following, then you end it's, up with a 
crazy situation like that. It's the frog in boiling water. I bring yeah. that up like constantly because yeah. like what they're doing is they're like, if they had raised the missions by 100 or, you know, by 50. Nobody would say that. No, it'd be a mass mutiny, like immediately. But you do it, oh, just five, just five more. And then five more and then five more. And you just keep <laughs> doing that. I mean, that's what they do in the real world. They've been doing it to us. And um, a lot of people are not paying attention to it. Um, but if, if you have some hard lines already set up in your mind that you're like, no, this is my hard line. I'm not going past it. If you consciously choose to do that, then you pull Yosarian in the end and you go, I'm not going any further. And I don't think a lot of people are cognizant enough to uh, realize that someone could push them and push them and push them, which is actually an abuse technique. <laughs> so uh if you're if you're not aware of it you you fall into it like so easily and and that happens to most people most people are not that cognizant to the boiling water well it's uh, well just looking at covid and the pandemic and everything that's happened in the world not just in the u.s but over the world how the the liberty of everybody has been chopped in a little bit a little by little like you said We've been lucky in depending on where you are in the U.S., where you haven't lost all your liberty completely. And there's other places where you have, right, where you can't do anything or they would, they would be told, like, you can't go out. You have to stay in. And uh, you're like, ah. right, it's what you're saying, Alex, right? It's yeah. people start accepting it because it after you accept it a little bit, you're like, OK, well, you just go with it and you just give in and you're like, OK, I'm not going to. You know, I'm just going to conform, basically, right? And I, uh, I mean, I mean, what you guys are saying is totally. It's not just the frog in boiling water, though, um, Alex. It's you're correct about that, but it's also the leadership. You know, um, they're riding a tiger, right? They're just they're not trying to steer you towards a utopia or whatever a goal. They're just trying to make, hold on to their power, which is true in the book. Um, and it's true in life and it's true in all this stuff. You don't have these principles. So, I mean, this is a whole, you know, discussion rabbit hole that, you know, we can go on for hours, but, um, and, uh, Carrie and Carter do often, <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's totally true. It's not just, you know, it's, it's not just the, uh, the underlings, you know, as, as common, uh, as filthy masses, but it's, uh, it's the leadership too. They just want to hold on to power and they'll say or do whatever they need to. Uh, I've read the Gulag Archipelago and I've read other accounts of people who were in Gulags. Um, one is uh, Nathan Sh uh, Sharansky, uh, who was in there in the 70s. And he said he was, he said he was never tempted to say what they wanted him to say. He was in the Gulags for like 10 years. And he said he was never tempted because he had such strong, uh, you know, um, like he knew what his principles were so strongly. Um, and you read in uh, Gulag Archipelago about um, a few people. One, I think, was like an old woman in, in Gulag uh, that, uh, you know, she she was released after three months because she wouldn't confess. But it's three months of horrible interrogation. But then she, you know, she had such a strong cord that they had to release her because she wouldn't confess. Um, but, you know... Uh, yeah, uh, any any uh, any normal Joe can become, um, you know, Gestapo SS um, just by going along, um, and it's it's the reason why we have to know what we believe and not just what we're against. So that's it. The old woman you bring up reminds me of, um, and I, I like to use it sometimes, there's a quote from um, the Salem Witch Trials where a guy was, they were putting rocks on his chest and more and more rocks and trying to force him to confess that he was into witchcraft and everything. And uh, one point they have so much weight on him. And at one point they asked him, are you going to confess? And he says, more weight. And that those two words, they're so important to the idea that no amount of torture, no amount of pressure is, should make you give up on your principles. And he, I mean, he died, but it's 
if you're if you believe in your principles, if you have principles, then you are you should be willing to die for them. <laughs> That's just how it should be. And yeah, sometimes I, I love that quote. I just I throw it everywhere when these people try to, you know, like, oh, just give in, just give in. No, more weight. <laughs> You're making me want to go rewatch V for Vendetta because there's a similar thing that happens in there. But what, what, one of my favorite characters in Catch-22, just to sort of try to stay on top of was, uh, was that general who, uh, um, who rode in at the end of every battle and he looked very like, you know, I love that guy. He, he cracked me up. And then he like got injured, but it just made him look more dignified. Like that was... That was amazing. I, I love that guy. He, he and he got injured up. by a flower. That was like, he <laughs> got injured by yeah. a flower in the eye. And then and you the, meet the, the old guy person. who threw the fro- yeah. flower at him. Yeah, it was it was the kind of the pimp, uh, the bordello manager guy who injured both in, injured him both times or injured. Did he say he injured the Pope or something? He injured someone. Yeah, and it was intentional too. It wasn't yeah. like... Uh, Oops, he threw a flower. It turns out there was someone trying to injure him with a flower. <laughs> One of my favorite parts, if we're, uh, if, we, if we could read some of our favorite lines, maybe. I really like that scene I mentioned earlier with the chaplain and uh, Colonel Cathart, and they're talking about prayers. And when he sort of says, like, he doesn't want to have any prayers with God in it <laughs> or religion. <laughs> Can you find a prayer without God or death or religion? And uh, and then and then later when he says uh, something about oh oh the chaplain says uh, you know about the time length he's like well you want to make sure you have time for the atheist to leave the room and he's like what there are no atheists it's illegal <laughs> he's like chaplain's like no it's not illegal <laughs> that it's un-American he's like uh, I don't know I'm not sure if it's un-American and then he and then he says uh, he's shocked that he wants the enlisted men there too and this is one of my favorite parts he says um he's he says the the chaplain says he thinks well the enlisted men should be there I assume you wanted them there uh, uh since they'd be going on the same missions and the colonel says well I don't they've got a god and a chaplain of their own haven't they and he says no sir and he goes what are you talking about you mean they pray to the same god that we do yes sir and he listens i think so yeah the other part carrie that i liked there was when <laughs> when the, the the chaplain's like when he says like find something without god in it and he's kind of like well the whole book kind of <laughs> <references God." laughs> he's like yeah. looking at the bible uh-huh. Carrie is it's funny that you brought that section up because it continues on where Colonel Cathcart is talking about how he has nothing I don't have anything against enlisted some enlisted are my friends and I yes and, yes and my note okay enlisted versus officers is stand in for race relations brilliant because you consider the time in which this book was written because yeah. if you change enlisted and officers to black and white in this section of the book, and you have a commentary on American race relations right then and there. Absolutely. Uh, I was absolutely floored. Yeah. He even says, it's not that I think they're, and then he says what he thinks they are, like brutes or, or something. <laughs> you know? Right, yeah. You know, it's, it's like when, think, yeah. <laughs> when people tell you what they really think, and they're made, yeah. Uh, he says it isn't. It isn't that I think enlisted men are dirty, common, and inferior. Uh, it's just that I think that they're dirty, common, and inferior. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about the guy who got his eye. It was Major uh, the Coverly who got his eye wounded, right? Major what blank, the blank? The Coverly. Yeah. What's the blank? Uh, it, it what was that only- about? No one was ever brave enough to ask him his name. Oh, is that? Oh, I do remember that reference. Okay, that came later. For a while, I was really confused by that. It's hilarious how they read that in the audiobook because every single time the audiobook, you know, a narrator goes, Major, mm hmm, did cover really. (laughs) He said, mm hmm, every time. I wonder if it was like a reference to like um, earlier literature, like Victorian novels and stuff, because they'd, and I think I should maybe like Russian novels as well, they'd have like blanks for some characters as well, because there, there are a lot of references to other books and poets and stuff. So I wondered if it was something to do with that. 
Somebody... Yeah, speaking to re about references, there's another line. I'm just going to read a line that I like. It was it, this one's about Lieutenant Scheisskopf, which apparently means shithead in German. Shithead. Um, but there's a there's a description of him here that says he knew everything about literature except how to enjoy it, which I really I really love as a description. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say thank you, Big Ugly Clowno gave us a super chat and said, oh, he was he's talking about what you're talking about, Mo. He said there's a great Dark Horse clip with Brett Weinstein about Cats 22 where Major DeCoverly give everybody eat, ending the loyalty oath nonsense. We put that link, Mo gave us the link, we put it in the chat. And then uh, I'll fight you naked. Thank you, I'll fight you naked. It says, soon there will be the gammon strain of COVID which will only kill Francis Foster. I'm assuming that's a British joke and a trigonometry joke. Am yeah, I Gammon's like, and any it's kind of like a, a white man who voted for Brexit. Oh, the kind okay. of pink. Oh, okay. Pink skin. It's so, and I assume Francis Foster is in that category. Is he? Did he vote? For I, he didn't Brexit? vote for Brexit, but he's oh. kind of got a gammon voice. He's that's actually funny. half Venezuelan, so. <laughs> it's not well, that doesn't matter. I'm wondering, actually, if. Uh, the proper company response to like, remember, you know how people are pressuring companies to do uh, diversity and inclusion statements and, and stuff on their website. Maybe, maybe the right response is just give everybody eat. That, that can be the company's <laughs> statement. Harder. Can we just make for one day, the unsafe space logo, give everybody eat. <laughs> yeah, we should, we should change the tagline for a day or something. Just give everybody mm -hmm. eat. <laughs> Actually, what I thought was like the key sort of statement of the book was what difference does it make? That's what comes up again and again and again in like a positive way and in a negative way. It's like, why? what difference does it make if each person lives or dies? But what difference does it make if they choose to like, you know, try and do good rather than too bad to do bad? I, I would say, you know, this book is sort of a... I mean, it came out in the 60s, very, very turbulent time. Um, and uh, this book is sort of an argument for postmodernism, I would say, you know, because nothing is real in the book. And it's like, well, the society we live in, blah, 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 you know? So it's sort of like, um, you know, it, it sort of like goes along with all that, all that uh, scholarship of that time. Um, so, you know, it's a very, it's like walking a tightrope, like how you interpret the book, you know, um, because uh, you, you can interpret it however you want. You could say whatever you want is is garbage and, and uh, you could say, you know, you could put it in broad, narrow categories like so. So, um, I mean, but it, it, it is a great well, book. Yeah, I guess <laughs> you could also say that Lolita is an argument for pedophilia, but you know, literature is not real at the end of the day. So I think it's kind of responding to what, like the end of history or, you know, massive wars where people die for no reason and the amorality that can come out of that. But I, I do, th I think it kind of comes out in the end in more of a moral direction. But yeah, it could be interpreted. I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with you about that. Um, my, my point was that this all, like, postmodernism came out at the same time, right? Like, this is this book is a very countercultural book in, in, the, in the 60s, right? It's anti-military, uh, uh, it's anti-war, it's, right? So um, it was part of that whole movement. I'm not saying it was part of the, uh, the post-structuralist movement. I mean, it was part of the, uh, uh, you know, just the whole 60s, like, left wing like let's reevaluate um our our mores thing this is one of the things that gives uh postmodernism though and philosophies like that uh, legs because when they criticize if if they start by criticizing actual things that deserve criticism um it can definitely draw you in because there is real there is real critique to be made about this clearly um so I think, you know, if postmodernism had started or even critical theory had started, you know, prior to that, and the first thing that they said was there's infinite number of genders, uh, <laughs> like, I think so, so that would be a postmodernist thing to say, right? If they started with that, people would reject it. But if they start with, like, 
real critiques on real thing like that people re that really resonate with people um i think it lends them legitimacy and then they it, you know it might take 60 years to get to their infinite genders i mean i took uh a lot of grad literature courses and one of them was postmodernism in literature and which we didn't read this book and i don't know why it totally would have fit in there um but I, a lot of it, the way they explained it in the literature world was that a lot of it came about um, this idea that at any point in time, we could all die because of um, the bomb, you know? Uh, so there's no meaning to anything. So we might as well, you know, break all the rules. And that made sense from an artistic standpoint, you know, from for like going for new horizons, but it doesn't make sense in a, in a, human interaction <laughs> policy standpoint <laughs> uh, because you know you need to be able to get food to the people uh, but like in art I don't see a problem with postmodernism as a as a form of you know study but I think there's a difference between postmodernist art and what is now being produced which is very regimented actually it's not postmodernist. It, it has no exploration to it at all, like the, the original postmodernist in art. Um, so it's like, it's, it's almost a completely different thing at this point. Um, so I, I, I don't know that they're like comparable. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't even say necessarily that like, I don't, I don't know if postmodernism is required to do that, but it was the Venn diagram of postmodernism and this kind of treatment of things is largely overlapping. I don't think you actually need the postmodern philosophy to do this, but you do need to be willing to like create interesting fiction that questions stuff and like, and that that's, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, do you view this as a, do, Alex, do you view this as a postmodernist piece of art? Yeah, I do actually. Um, but I, I guess to me, I, I, I think postmodernism is a vehicle for what's going on right now, but I don't think it's actually the basis of what's going on. I think social constructivism is what's happening, which is completely different yeah. than postmodernism. No, I, that much I agree with. And I think the analogy that I've made is that postmodernism, postmodernists built a bunch of linguistic tools and yeah. then they've been picked up by people with really, uh, bad agendas like i th i think a, a postmodernist in general would say like i'm not trying to make i'm not trying to talk about reality necessarily i'm just trying to have thought exercises and and that's i guess valid um so so i i guess i i kind of understand that um but i th i think one of the things that we're seeing here though is um when you mentioned like they're not kind of thinking long term i don't know i'm paraphrasing what you said but they're kind of not thinking long term they're just thinking like how do we we could die tomorrow, you know, we might as well just do whatever because we could die tomorrow. That, I, I wouldn't call that necessarily a postmodernist idea, but there is something that's kind of nihilistic or hedonistic about that. And it, and it was kind of everywhere. Like even, like that's one of uh, Keynes' favorite, like Keynes the economist, when people criticized him when he came up with his theory of economics, one of the criticisms was, well, this isn't sustainable. Like in the end, this this will fall apart. And his response was, "Well, in the end, we're all dead anyway. Who cares, right?" So, once once you start um, limiting people's scope to what's like in the very very near future rather than long term, I think it massively changes the decisions they make and how they live their lives. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't I don't know how that fits. But <laughs> I'm not. I lost my train of thought. Sorry. No, 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 no. I get what you mean. It creates a, a nihilistic viewpoint. Uh, and and you, if you think nothing matters, the th decisions you make are uh, not considering consequences. Uh, so I get what you mean, and um, I think a big part of postmodernism in art was about they brought us to this point where we had these, we have these, you know, bombs that could just wipe us off the face of the planet, and that's what's wrong with the world, and that is incredibly nihilistic. Uh, but it is also, yeah, sure, ask those questions. I don't have a problem with that. But don't make any decisions that mean that you're hurting other people. And I think that's where when they take it into the real world and they start uh, deconstructing things to um, build a utopia, 
they're moving themselves in a genocidal direction. And I'm not okay with that. So the problem is they don't think it matters because nothing matters. That's what nihilism does. And uh, I think a lot of people assume that atheists are nihilistic and I, I can tell you and I probably are not. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so. and and so this book, I had that feel for most of the book, but towards the end, it changed. I, that's when I was like, oh, Yosarian maybe was nihilistic, but he grew like something happened where things mattered at some point and principles matter, yes. and that's that's one of the things I really like about it. Yeah, um, I think that's why I didn't like the beginning, aside from the fact that stylistically it was jumping back and forth and it was doing all those things that after you've finished it, you recognize are purposeful so that you're sort of disoriented. But it was jumping, the jumping back and forth and the plays with language and how somebody would finish a conversation and someone else would pick it. Would, one end of a conversation would be the beginning of it, like a sentence would be the beginning of a different one. And these weird stylistic choices were throwing me off, but also I think it, part of it was, it felt nihilistic to me. And I was reminded of when we read the one, the one book I didn't like, oh, Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, because it was also absurd like that, Absurd, right? and mm -hmm. I felt sort yeah. of nothing matters and everything's yeah. meaningless. And, um, but this book changed for me. And he, it definitely, by the end, I think it leaves you with hope and it leaves you with a moral, example of, of a better choice it's saying this is a better choice to make of how to be that's um, what i said. well one thing i liked about this book and hitchhikers although they did it in a different way was they both referenced like ridiculous things that sounded like the guy was just you know writing whatever came to his mind but then later on you know there was a rhyme and a reason behind it like uh in hitchhiker there was one part where like an alien just comes down walks out and says to what he's stranded on an island and says to him like you're a moron and then goes back in his ship and, and flies away and then later on there's like actually a whole backstory to that so um i don't know how much of hitchhikers you read but i read all five books like two years ago and uh i thought it was i thought it was brilliantly done like that um but uh i, I also want to say like um um you know i like those old um the really old movies like from like the Marx Brothers and Abbott and Costello and, and those guys. And those guys were sort of like, I, you know, um, they, they were always like in, in fine society, right? High society. And they were always um, being like nuts and just, and just totally deconstructing almost. Like, I don't mean to use that in a postmodern way, but that's what they were doing. They were deconstructing uh, all the, uh, you know, mannerisms and, and, um, uh, I don't know, all the unwritten rules of that kind of uh, society, uh, they were always doing that. They were always mocking it. They were making jokes that I can't believe they made in the 30s. Um, and, uh, and this, is, at, at first, seems to be going with that. Now, everyone said at the end, like, Heller actually has something to fight for, which is not postmodern. But, um, you know, I do find the beginning of this, um, like, you know, there is a reason to like rethink like, oh, this high society, this high culture, like why do they, you know, why do they, uh, I don't know, do what they do, right? Like in the movie Titanic, like why why do they do all this stuff, right? Um, and, uh, and this sort of went further with the military, um, but I mean, the people in the military are like, you know, inept. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of like getting scattered in my thoughts here, but I, it, my point is like, I do feel there's sort of like a evolution of that, um, craziness of the, of the old, uh, Marx brothers and, and that kind of thing, um, going into this book, um, that Heller is, is, uh, building upon, um, and maybe like inevitably that kind of thing. Like maybe inevitably, if you have high culture with these rules that don't really have just sort of like, you know, um, mutated and whatever, and everyone's like, oh, we don't say this because that shows you're like global and whatever. And, you know, maybe that kind of stuff inevitably leads to, to postmodernism because it's like, well, why do we do this? Well, there's no rule, just everyone sort of does it, right? And then we have to rethink, oh, so what are our principles? But 
you know, like that's hard. That's hard to like remember where our principles were. So um, I don't know. I think it's just sort of a historical lesson that we can all take out of it. Um, yeah, I think that social conventions have been kind of deconstructed in literature for like hundreds of years. Um, it's like people think of like medieval writing as being really reverential and proper, but it's just, you know, body slapstick comedy with loads of swearing in it. Um, but people can't read it, so they don't they don't know that. Um, so we got we kind of go through these cycles. But I, I would I actually st started trying to read Catch 22 a while ago and I couldn't read it. And I don't know why, because I think because I had like flashbacks of the actual film, which is not very nice. Um, but then because I had this time pressure and I thought I'll, I'll go to this uh, group. So I really like rushed through it. And I normally wouldn't read like a military book, but the kind of slapstick elements of it and the comedy as aspect of it was really helpful for me in getting that, in getting through that. But yeah, I, I actually, I really enjoyed this book, especially towards the end where it does get really, for me, I thought it did get really deep um, towards the end when he's like walking through, I think it's the, the second last chapter that someone mentioned already when he sees all this kind of horror around him. Um, it's like that kind of Bruegel painting, like the, the hell visions of kind of people like kill, doing all these hor horrific things to each other. And he's, there was a re the line that I really, I don't know if I can find it quickly, but when he's sort of talking about like in parts of Africa where they sell children to other people to be eaten and mm. that it surprises him that the boys will do it so stoically because there's this kind of and that he doesn't feel anything about it and there's this kind of I love that moment of like you know how do you you have to have these defense mechanisms in the knowledge that horrific things are happening elsewhere and you can't like you have to protect your own sanity so but he assumes that they're pressure. stoic. He actually doesn't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And, and he assumes that because he assumes that no one could be so evil to do it if they weren't stoic. But they could be evil enough to do it, I guess, if they were stoic. I, I yeah, because it, it's about this um, protective. There's, it, He says at another point, this is protective rationalization. Like you, there's a reason you go, oh, of course, they, they probably wanted to do it. It's kind of like when you look at war films and they're presented as like very, you know, patriotic because it's easier to think that rather than to be like they were shitting themselves all the time and it was like the real horror is you know much worse to contemplate well there was a uh, it seems like every once in a while we go through like uh, a society will go through a period where war is patriotic and then there's a period afterwards where everyone's like no it's not it was freaking awful and you're lying to yourself because like that happened after the civil war too there was you know everyone was going on about how patriotic the civil war was and then all the poetry came out and it was oh my god if you have to read that poetry it's it's almost stomach turning because it's viciously uh like like someone's missing a jaw like it's horrifying and um and then, and, and that happens every war, like like 20 years when the guys come back and they're like, it wasn't patriotic, it sucked. I don't know why you acted like it was such a good thing. <laughs> and because when they come back, they're like, that was horrifying. And you lied to us. But then it gets forgotten by the next two couple generations later, right? And then they do it again. Yeah, what, uh, what, I, I read a book um, about the Second World War and um, that book claimed that before Pearl Harbor, America was like, that was one of the most divided times in American history that the, the people who wanted to um, uh, enter the war and the people, the isolationists, right? Uh, they say that that was one of the most crazy times, like, you know, which sort of gives me hope for today's world. Um, but uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's just my two cents. Yeah, although there's a lot of rumors that they, I don't know the, velicid, the veracity of these because I'm not a historian, I haven't studied, but like there's a lot of rumors that there was kind of prior knowledge of Pearl Harbor and it was allowed to happen, right? For that reason. Oh, they say that about lots of things. It might be true, who knows? <laughs> That's how scouts Jones. Sorry, I got you guys to monetize. Sorry about that. 
I just just before I forget, um, I I would there's a film. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen it called Son Son of Soul, um, which came out like maybe three years ago, which is a horrific, horrible film about um, in this I think it's called Sonner Commander inside the um, concentration camps where they would enlist the men sort of young men to kind of clear up bodies and basically so it's it's a really just on that kind of topic of the 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 dark horror of of war and the reality of it it's like a hungarian film if anyone wants to be depressed well, well yeah thanks, one thing diane <laughs> <laughs> I have lots I of thinking about how everything there's like two sides to every coin and going back to what Alex was saying and some of you have been saying how I think in everything in life there's two sides to everything right in, a, in essence you can just looking at something that that you're trying to do for example you can do it from a very egotistical just for what it's good for me versus the complete other side where you're doing it completely for something that is more uh benefiting others, nothing that benefits you, for example. And, and in, in, in a lot of situations that we see in the book and, you know, in life that we run into, it is like that. And it depends on how you're looking at it. Like you're saying, Alex, like in the civil war or during different points in time, at one point, everybody's like, yeah, patriotism is great. Or, 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 and then the other side of the coin, when you're looking at it from another perspective, is like terrible. Nobody, I mean, nobody's happy. Obviously, war is horrible. And a lot of the things that have, that you see in the book are, are reflections of how horrible war is. Now, I don't like war either. But I think that war does have, unfortunately, I mean, at least from my experience of, and what I've learned through looking at the world, sometimes you do have to go to war, unfortunately. Because it just doesn't depend on what you think. And how you, if you just let other people just walk over you and you just give in to whatever they want to do, then. And you, yeah, although, uh, although like if you, okay, you can say the Revolutionary War was necessary because we needed yeah. to separate. It's hard to make that case for the Civil War. Uh, yeah, it's well, very hard war. to make that case for World War One, And it's kind of even hard to make that case for World War Two in Europe. Uh, yeah. Maybe you could make the case for the Asian theater, but uh well, and right now, a lot of wars that too. aren't necessary. <laughs> well, yeah. no, absolutely true. Because you don't even know now what is real. I mean, why are things being done the way they're done? Because it's you become very skeptical of almost everything, right? It's like that you you're told something, but it's not you're being told that way just so that you act in the way they want you to act, right? And they're telling you something so that it convinces you to accept it. And it's not real or what they were telling. Well, we've seen it. We've seen it. We see it in life over the last. I just, I just want to say. We've been living through that. I just want to say you really have to know your facts because, you know, like like Canada, right? um, Justin Trudeau was going to criticize China for the Uyghurs. And then, and then China said, uh, you know, well, you know, we just found all these bodies from the, the residential schools, right? Um, which is true, but I mean, that happened 50 years ago and the Uyghurs are happening now. And there's all sorts of, you know, different things going on. It's, it's really like, you know, it's really like, uh, you're just caught, you're just caught unawares, right? But, but it's like, it's it's like yeah the bad actors are going to use your own conscience against you which is why you have to remove yourself and you really have to like learn everything you can if you're going to enter this arena because yeah. otherwise you're just going to be like twisted i just heard james or understand understand or, what their ulterior motives are that yeah. you perhaps cannot yeah. you know that you perhaps wouldn't necessarily see but trying to see it from their perspective. Well, it's like the, right, it's like the chapter with Milo uh, where he he's like a master manipulator and he goes in and what's his real motive is to not have to fly any more combat missions. But he goes in and what does he do? He he pretends to be a normal, uh, a person who's plagued by guilt for having only flown five missions and everybody else has flown like 70 or something. And he's, 
I want to fly more. I want to do my part, you know, and then, but I have this big, you know, this business at this, uh, that I have to run. And, and then he, he goes into great detail and makes himself seem indispensable so that the guy's like, there's no way we can let you fly more missions. In fact, we're going to have other pilots fly all of your missions from now on. <laughs> and it's just, what is that? Ulti- but see people, I thought he was just a great archetype of a, a certain, like you were saying, Diane, how he had certain people mapped out as like, this person is a psychopathic personality mm. or whatever, just sort of showing you different personality types, the the range of humans uh, and, and different ways people can be disordered. And I just thought, what a great duplicitous, self-serving, but presenting himself as self-sacrificing um, manipulator. Yeah. I, sorry, I just want to say I disagree about Milo. I don't think he oh. was. I don't think he was cluster B. You know, I don't think he was that. I think, based on the environment he was in, he was he was a good businessman. Gaming the system. Yeah. 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 If he was doing that in a normal liberal society, I would agree with you, you know, but in that environment, he's surviving and he's getting ahead. I don't think he's cluster B. I think he's just- Oh, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily think he's cluster B. I don't think I said that, but I think he's a manipulator. Mm -hmm. And I think he has motives that like, that maybe maybe it's maybe it's not that the, it's not that the guys who said, okay, you can't, you don't have to fly. It's not that they, um couldn't see through it it's just you're living in this world where you're just going to take what people say at face value and then be easily manipulated into like okay well then you're never going to fly again you don't have to fly at all like he went his motivation going into that talk i don't think anybody would argue was that he wanted to fly more yeah he was clearly a good manipulator like that i think that's that that's obvious right so i i I agree with you on that whether he was also a cluster b isn't Maybe. Yeah, no. I heard. I heard the ter- I heard you say the word sociopathic, but maybe. Uh, oh, I was sure. saying that was about uh, the something Diane had said about uh, mm-hmm. what's his name, uh, the guy who who raped uh, Arfie. Arfie. Oh. Arfie. Yeah, being a psychopath. Okay. I'm sorry. That's my bad. Sorry. Okay. You know something yeah. that 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 uh, this book. <sighs> it's something I think is relevant, and, and it's a kind of a sad truth, but. Uh, it's rational to be when you're in an environment like that. Like I know we were saying, oh, you like I think Manny, you were saying, oh, you have to know all the facts and you have to learn all this stuff. And like the truth is, it's impossible to know all of the facts. Yeah. It's impossible to know when you're being lied to. When you're in that situation, you can't actually trust anything. And mm-hmm. that's a horrifying, like that's a horrifying revelation to to be hit with. But I think in many ways. I don't want to sound neurotic, but maybe I'm a little, like in many ways I look at the clown world that we're in now, which is just a version of what's in Catch-22, and I don't really know what to believe by default. I don't by default believe anything, basically, unless like I happen to be interested in C primary sources or whatever, but like it's hard to actually take anything seriously because there's an awareness that all of this clown world crap is going on all around me at so many different levels with so many different agendas that there are Cathcarts and Milo's and, you know, like uh, all the General different Peckham, personalities. All, they're yeah. all around and, and there's, yeah. and there's exponentially more of them than there were in this book. And, and they're, who knows what their motives and things are. So it's, it's kind of, it, it makes sense to be a little bit like, I don't know, maybe Alex Jones is right about some stuff or what like, I don't know. The answer is I kind of don't know and probably can't for a lot of things. And then we had the old man at the bordello and he spoke volumes talking to Nate Lee. And I, I, I made two notes on that one. One was military industrial complex and the other was the folly of war. But in one, he says, but of course I do. The Germans are being driven out and we are still here. In a few years, you will be gone and we will still be here. You see, Italy is really a very poor and weak country. And that's what makes us so strong. Italian soldiers are not dying anymore, but American and German soldiers are. I call that doing extremely well. Um, and that hit me because I'm like, OK, we're in Afghanistan. We're pulling out of Afghanistan. We've been in Chad. We've been uh, we went to Vietnam. We went to Korea, you know, all of these different places, you know, Iraq. 
uh, every place that we have been, Kuwait, Somalia, uh, the Balkans, I just, I cannot even, in all of my mind, I cannot even think since the fall of the wall, all of the places that we have sent soldiers to openly and secretly to help spread democracy. And it's disgusting, absolutely disgusting. And, and then he says, the old man says, you put so much stock in winning wars. The real trick is in losing wars. And I just sat here and thought Afghanistan, war on terror, Vietnam, Korea. I mean, the list goes on and on. And it just goes back to what you guys were saying. We don't know why we go in there. And there's been so much written about Vietnam as to why we actually went in there. Who didn't want us in? Who didn't want us in? Why, you know, what's around all of that? Why are we in Afghanistan? The Soviets told us, don't bother. But we're arrogant. We went in anyway. And now we're leaving with our tails tucked between our legs. And even Jen Psaki says, no, they're not going to get a hero's welcome home. Well, fuck you, Jen. We lost blood over there. Men and women died over there. They should at least get a thank you and a pat on the back. Not that I'm a, not that I believe in war, but my God, at least tell the people who went over there, thanks for trying. And now who's going to go back in there? And we don't know what the real motivations are. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like, especially after reading that book that we read for book club, uh, the management of savagery, I just... I don't even have an opinion half the time anymore because I have no idea, but I know that I'm probably being lied to. <laughs> so I, it's probably the motivations are different than what I'm being told. So. And I wouldn't tell a young person to join the military nowadays. Like that's not a thing to do. Uh, it's, it's a thing to do. If you trust your leadership, joining the military is a thing to do. And if it's like, oh, our leadership is, is the best in the world in terms of like preserving freedoms and we need to like, yeah, if you're actually worried about communism spreading and it's, you're in the Cold War and like you 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 feel like commies are going to take it, like if that's really what you think's going on and you really think this is the best way to to prevent that, then then joining the military makes sense. But when it's this, why would you join the military? Who knows where they'll send you for what reason? What are I you? I don't. I don't trust you know? my local mayor. <laughs> I mean, I don't trust my local city council because I know what kind of shitty shysters they are for a dollar a year. So I know they're cutting deals with with local open contracts. So, I mean, I know I'm not I sure as hell don't trust the feds. I don't trust my mayor either, but I'm in Phoenix and everybody knows why. <laughs> hey, somebody in the chat pointed out something kind of funny. You know, you were talking about how eerie it was, the character named Snowden. Somebody in the chat was like, Milo, My, Milo, you know, it's kind of eerie. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, we, we see. Can yeah, I do a super Mar chat? Actually, there's yeah. a, uh, someone says, Carter, it was, I fight naked. It says, Carter, it was declassified. They knew Pearl Harbor was going to happen eight days ahead of time. Japanese mini -sub subs showed up 10 hours early and they kept it quiet when they caught them. I didn't know that, but. They tried yeah, to drive the US into the war getting kind of on back on because we were kind of talking about milo and whether he was the psychopath or that reminded me because he he organized the bombing of of their their own that was for me that was the kind of oh right you know, he is you know evil in some way i you're you're totally right i forgot about that and and i, I had the same reaction as you yeah yeah that does make also, him a psychopath in some there's also like a, that's right <laughs> there's also kind of a uh, heartless evil, like a, an, an unmeaning evil, like in that penultimate chapter when he goes to the first aid kit to get the morphine and, the, and there's just the note from Milo. Yeah, and like, I, I was, what I was going to say before was, do you, is the syndicate just a fiction? Because that was what I was starting to think, because when he writes on the piece of paper, a share, yeah. and he keeps, it's kind of, he, he wins out because he is good with words, and also because I think his superiors are not or less bright than him and i think the people at the top of the structure are the are not very intelligent and um, which i thought i found was quite uh, apt for how things are at least in my experience the, the ones who kind of get to the top are maybe not you know the the most competent and the most sort of bright i think the idea is that they're good at getting promoted not that they're yeah. good at 
what they're doing. Also, there's this idea, and it, it's in business to get promoted until you're not good at your job anymore, like promoted yeah. out of <laughs> your abilities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's failing upward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I get that they were incompetent, and I totally agree with that. But I also sometimes wondered, sometimes Milo's stuff was so obvious that I sometimes wondered if they just didn't care, like that there were some secret, like, we're all evil together, and I'm getting something out of it. So I don't really, I'm going to let you write a share on a paper and walk away. Like, I don't I th care. I think that Milo represents so much, so much greed, and he probably, maybe he was buying everybody, right? Yeah. Like, which happens a lot, where he would somehow pay people off to just go with with him or or the, you're in the syndicate so you're benefiting from it too and he was using that as a way to uh to manipulate or control everybody or because people have uh, financial interests right unfortunately or just that people That's at the it. top had petty interests yeah. like i like fresh yeah. eggs it's like oh well True. yeah i'm gonna I'm let milo do his egg. thing because i like fresh go. eggs right yeah what i always thought like what what well see what you see i wonder what you guys think about the the, the, the girl that was trying to kill Joseph <laughs> and she was jumping out, out from the bushes <laughs> and she was like falling in from everywhere. What, what do you think is, uh, what does she represent? What, is, what, are you, what are your thoughts? I, I mean, to me, she's a great representation of the kind of rational paranoia that, because remember he's, he spent most of the book, especially at the beginning, talking about how everyone's out to kill him. Right. Like they're yeah. all, everyone's trying to kill him. And, that's true uh, in a very abstract way. And she she kind of brings that to um, fruition in a very concrete way because she ceases to become that woman. And she becomes like, remember there's a spot where he's like, she, she, like this person could turn into her and, and attack him. Like everyone is a potential threat. She's like she's everywhere and she could be anyone. And she's trying to actively kill him. So to me, I look at her as a kind of concretization of that kind of abstract, rational and warranted anxiety that he has. Yeah, and but then kind of luckily in, in a way, it, it's kind of like she's the savior in a way because she gets him into hospital. Is that how True. it works? So it's kind yeah. of like, yeah. you know, he's, he's trying to avoid pain and violence um, as much as possible, but then there's like the kind of injury that will sort of actually get him at, into the situation. Um, Sometimes it's maybe it's that scrape with death that causes you to reevaluate what's important. And he has that scrape with death and it's like, then he decides not to make the deal and not to sell his soul. But I think you're right, Carter. I think she just sort of represents his, the, the ever present reminder that death could be around any corner. And mm -hmm. I sort of was reminded of a comedy film. I can't remember what it was with the Grim Reaper kind of popping out every once in a while. It's like a running gag. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Maybe that, maybe I just dreamed that. Anyway. <laughs> it don't dream that, that Carrie. It reminded me of Don't Look Now, um, the horror film um, where like, I, well, I probably, I'm going to spoil it, but yeah, there's a kind of sort of sort of macabre, but also comical murder that happens. It's set in Italy as well, so it reminded me. It reminded me of cartoons because um, they that's a gag they like to pull sometimes in a cartoon where you can't you, this person's inescapable everywhere you turn they show up, you know. Yeah, and so it was it, very cartoony, and I yeah. uh, I loved it though. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a funny part from, but at the same time, like you said, irrational, right? <laughs> Why is she so mad at him that she wants to kill him? What what, what are you just telling her that? Supposedly, her her lover died, and she just takes it out on him, uh, and I'm he just doesn't know why. It's one of those things. But it's quite a clever book because you don't really need to know whether it's a hallucination, whether it's real, because it could be mm -hmm. real. But it could also right. be a hallucination. But he because was also the point, messenger. At one point, Hungry Joe goes. Yeah, kill the messenger. You, it, <laughs> you almost think it happened, and Yosarian's all like. It did happen. You were right there. You saw her. You flew us back to Rome to drop her off. What are you talking about? Just, and that, that just like adds to the comedy and the insanity of it. Like, is it a hallucination? I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's sort of like gaslighting is, right? You're being told something that is 
you know, like I saw it with my own eyes and you're being told different. And at what point do you start doubting yourself and not believing what you think is true and believe what you're being told is true? I was frustrated for the chaplain that he never realized that Yosarian actually was naked in the tree that day. And he really started to question his own sanity because it seemed like such an absurd thing and he assumed that it couldn't have happened. So it must've been something. And he really, he really, it really upset him quite a lot. And it really caused a lot of introspection and reflection. And, you know, the truth was actually quite simple. Yosarian was naked in a tree. But he, it did kind of, rest, didn't it kind of restore his faith in a way that in miracles. So he couldn't like, it know. was, he couldn't explain it. So it was like, there must be some mystical thing going on and it's not all dark. Um, but it, that seemed to give him anxiety because he wasn't sure what thing was going on. Remember, he was, he was the guy classifying all the things and he's like, well, this is the thing that's not these three things that I know. I don't know mm -hmm. how to classify this. Like... It, it definitely gave him quite a lot of anxiety. I don't know if in the end, maybe in the end it did help his faith. I don't know. But yeah, I, I felt bad for him. I felt bad for the chaplain because I was like, the poor guy, Yosarian's going to leave. Hopefully Yosarian finds the 12-year-old in Rome and helps her out. Who knows if that happens? And hopefully he goes to Sweden and, and hangs out with Orr and everyone's happy. That's the American ending that I want. Um, but poor... Mm -hmm. Poor chaplain's <laughs> never going to know that he wasn't actually crazy. And he's still under surveillance. And probably it's so likely he could get in trouble for being Washington Irving. Who knows what will happen to him, right? I felt the most sorry for major, 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 major. <laughs> because yeah. for one thing, yeah. being saddled with that name and then being saddled with that rank. And then he was given like flight commander. And he was finally, 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 like having friends for the first time in his life. And they give him that flight commander position. And then suddenly no one's his friend. And he like even tries to like put on a disguise so that he can play basketball with them. And he's so lonely. He's so lonely. And then he creates his own catch 22. You can't let them into my office unless I'm out. <laughs> I don't want to see anybody. <laughs> yeah. And he like, he doesn't want food. He doesn't want. He doesn't even want to stay in his home. I mean, it's like, it's, he's like the, the most tragic of the ones that like is alive throughout. Maybe after him, Dr. Nika, because his well, wife ends twice. up rich and leaves and he has no way of talking to anyone. I mean, those two are to me, the, the ones I found the saddest. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I want to ask um, again, like, you know, I'm hazy in this, you guys are fresh. But uh, I remember there was a Tex, right? In the hospital, Tex, like the guy yeah, there was in a Texas. Texas. Yeah. yeah. Right? And he was like, I liked him, but he was treated like garbage. <laughs> like I sort of liked him. Um, I remember this, like I don't remember, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe like he said something awful at the end of his, his uh, arc, his short arc in the book, but uh, what happened with him, like, like, and and what did people think about? He him? was he was actually kind of horrible. He was like one of those like really fun, nice, you know, everybody's supposed to like him. He's charming, <laughs> but he would say like really, really horrible shit about people, like in a nice way. <laughs> and uh, so when when the guy in the cast died, the first time, the first one. They, everyone was like, you killed him. That's what they said to the Texan because they, they hated the Texan because he was so charming and talkative, but also cruel. So they like all put the guy's death on the Texan. And he was like the only one who like didn't recover. <laughs> I said, I, I wrote it down because I was writing it down a lot at the beginning. The, tex the Texan was likable. In three days, no one could stand him. Yes. Um, yeah, he was kind of obnoxious, though, right? Because he was standing over he, the he like, the guy and like voting rights for pe for certain people. Yeah, and he was also just oh, kind of yeah, making that's... crap up. He's a nice guy, and it's like he was just kind of a little bit. He was one of the people at the beginning, and I was like, this guy's kind of insane. Mm -hmm. You just have to talk to him. He's a nice guy. It's like there's, there's he's a. Well, I, I remember, yeah, yeah, I do remember him talking to that body cast soldier, and I remember him like being charming. But I mean, I guess I guess my memory is faulty because. 
I thought they just didn't like him because he was so chatty and positive. I thought it was sort of a yeah, I think you're right. I think you're a right. commentary on if you're acting sane, then you must be insane. And if you're acting insane, you must be sane. That sort of thing in this crazy world, you know, how could anybody be so? That's what my memory of positive. Is, what you're saying. But yeah, you know what? Yeah, now but positivity talking... didn't make like it's not appropriate. Like it, it, like and he was like oddly Pollyanna positive. He was like. <laughs> He was insanely positive. It was wrong to be that positive. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> was it now that you're talking about that hospital room uh, or the hospital uh, scene? The guy in the uh, uh, the whole body cast that never spoke and how they made up story. I mean, because he didn't speak. Now they all started making up stories about him. So they created his own story for him, even though they never. I mean, they already had. All this stuff, they were saying all this stuff about him and who he was and how he was. And they I all believed I just pictured him covered in like third degree burns or something. Yeah. Like, like a really horrible, you know, no no lips or anything. And yeah, and no eyelids, like a really horrible victim. And he just treated like a like a like a com comedic prop. Yeah. So awful. <laughs> I don't remember i guess I'm, i just don't remember him saying anything awful it was dunbar who said the, i'm sorry the tech i'm going back to the texan i thought it was just that he was just yeah positive and and he taught oh they said you killed him because remember he uh the guy in the body cast couldn't get away from him so he talked to him the whole time <laughs> and when they said right. you killed him i thought they were basically saying you talked him to death yeah, no, I thought they were saying that too. But then they yeah. changed their mind and they decided the nurse killed him because she took his temperature. So the whole, I mean, the whole thing was, I, I, it was the Texan who made up the stories about him though. They were all talking about him, but it was the Texan who kind of gave him the backstory too, right? Because he was standing over him chatting oh, so. and, then, and then saying, oh, he, this is what he's like. And it's like, how, how would you know? He just made it up. Well, he was the only one who talked to him. So maybe he was able to- But he never talked him. back. Yeah, so. the, the guy couldn't talk. It was I know was I know stories about him. Look, I'm a little I'm a little more inclined to, yeah. to believe you should be positive no matter yeah. what. No, 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 so, of course. So I I, I I I I'm a little more like like partial to him, I guess, than you are, Carter. <laughs> you're, you're like you're like you should you should be morose and, and miserable. Right? Yeah, I like the Texan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think he should Next. be necessarily morose and miserable. It's just that there's something when I see someone like that in a situation like that, um, there's clearly an element of denial of reality, right? Which is like th there's there's a way to be positive and hopeful and recognizing your circumstances. And the Texan seems to be in like this fairyland fantasy world, which which is which is evident because he's talking to a shell of a person and pretending that he's having meaningful dialogue with him, which is clearly not happening right yeah maybe he's being nice maybe like he realizes the guy the guy's just lying there at least someone's talking to him at least there's some assuming, True. assuming the guy's awake right like mm -hmm. there's that like that's what i that's the impression i got from him um, i was thinking about but maybe that. i'm just maybe i'm just in a fantasy world of positivity <laughs> so sorry about that i was thinking about that though and it's like maybe some people like there's there's someone you might want to have talk at you when you couldn't talk or if you had the personality that you wanted that kind of social interaction but there's got to be someone who i i gotta imagine if i was in a full body cast and someone was talking at me 24 hours a day essentially i'd want to die <laughs> because <laughs> that'd be too much social interaction for me <laughs> it, yeah and, and they set him up to be someone that's that they don't appreciate him talking like and no one else appreciated him talking so why would the guy in the cast appreciate it because the guy in the cast is starving for human connection but it's a connection when somebody all that well you're just receiving yeah. the well, I guess I'm with maybe. Alex. I, if if I'm ever in a full body cast, do not send in the no, text. No, but obviously, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think they, it's, it's, it's kind of a symbol that there's some people who just talk just to talk and not really, you know, uh, if they can get someone who's quiet. They you, you guys, talk. you guys are, are probably more than I am. No, I, I like the Texan, but I definitely agree that he was 
that that the reason he's in the book is to show this whole like what you're saying carter that it's unnatural it's uh, it's unnerving to the other soldiers in the hospital that he's so positive during these horrible like that 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 that's viewed as being insane if you're it, you know if you're acting in a sane way and in insane surroundings and you know being crazy is viewed as being sane i think that's i think that's what he meant by putting him in there i thought he was I, I liked him. I thought it was just a funny touch. Cause like you said, Diane, at the, be at the beginning when it said after three days, nobody liked him cause he was so positive and friendly. And then also by the end of that chapter, he had, everybody left the war, everybody who was there pretending to be sick. So they wouldn't have to, uh, yeah, he drove them all back, to duty. Them all back to duty. <laughs> they couldn't stand being around his yeah. positivity. <laughs> but there, there is a theme in the book of like characters who have kind of like a uh, moral virtue in some way or, 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 it happens also with Col uh, Colonel Corn when he tries to perform at his best. He thinks he's going to get promoted, and instead, it's like um, I think is it Dreadle? I don't know who which guy it is. It's like oh, that guy makes me sick. Um, so the ones who kind of have some intention to please or to be good are the ones everyone thinks are you know despicable people. The, the Texan, I was like, woohoo, Texas in the house. And then I was like, no, no, not that one, not that one. <laughs> he would be fine at a church picnic, right? It, like, the, the, like it, was the, it was the context that made it weird. Yeah, but there is, you know, there are studies that like positive, you know, people will, will uh, um, you know, recover from cancer more than negative people and stuff like that. So, even, you know, and there's something called gallows humor and there's all sorts of things where you can be positive, even in situations that don't seem warranted. Obviously, that it's like appropriate and inappropriate, right? So you guys are saying he was inappropriately positive, maybe, but just because he was inappropriately positive doesn't mean positivity is wrong in that situation. But it isn't or also like, you know, he's a you know he's a mystery until the end and then you realize he he was a genius and yeah he, he had a plan and he was kind of this like idiot that he'd been playing up as an idiot who was like you know had these weird stories and pretending to be positive and stuff so i think it's kind of there's like two two representations of that i mean texan would have been a it would have been great to find out that texan was sent there by command to clear them all out of the hospital unless they were actually sick. Crazy. <laughs> like, like that was his purpose. Go it's be like, annoyingly positive and, and all the guys will leave unless they're it's actually like, sick. He's like the Ned Flanders, you know, he's like, <laughs> hi, ho, neighbors, we're all hanging yeah. out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> there is a character like that in Blackadder as well. <laughs> the one that Hugh Laurie plays. Oh, Hugh Laurie's in that? I love yeah. him. No, yeah, in Black, yeah, you have to watch uh, Black, Blackadder, especially Goes Forth. Um, He's always like, this is spiffing fun. This is wonderful. And he's, yeah, it's, it's, I just, I realized after reading this book, it's like, I think it was Ben Elton, like really robbed a lot from this book, the the whole kind of styling. So it's really, it's quite funny. So I would recommend it. It was so guys, we're... I was ahead, just going to say that I thought of Hugh Laurie before you said him, when you said that character, I was like, oh, that she's got to be talking about Hugh Laurie's <laughs> ultra positive character. <laughs> yeah you've got Stephen Fry is the general and then Hugh Laurie's like a, I don't know what his but they're like the posh ones and then the other characters are like just kind of the serving officers so guys we are uh reaching two hours here of book club with Catch 22 I want to give everybody a chance if there's any uh really important if there's an important like closing comment or something that you wanted to say that you get a, did get a chance to say feel free. Yeah, we have a smaller group today, so hopefully everybody got, felt like they got time to talk. Um, we are, next month, we're going to be returning to nonfiction. August 15th, which is a, again a Sunday, we're going to be discussing the Anarchist Handbook by Michael Malice, which Carter reminds me is a collection of essays by other people. Is that correct? Yeah, I think he did like uh, the intro and some other stuff. But the reason I'm stressing that is uh, I think he's the guy. I mean, he's a great guy to figure out what the right anarchist essays are to introduce people to the subject. So I'm I'm really curious to see what he's put together. And I think he's got some Lysander Spooner in there and some other stuff. So 
we'll see um, what it's, I haven't started it, but yeah. So all right. Anybody have any final thoughts? Um, I just want to say that I've only been on one other book club. That was the Cynical Theories one. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it was nice to uh, actually have more time to talk and just be a little more organic than that yes. one, which felt like a karaoke bar where you had to wait your turn. So yes, uh. <laughs> <laughs> that was our biggest one. I think we have fifty people. By far. Yeah. 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 I like the size of this. This was a this was a good one. So. Um... We still have to we have to start picking books that people don't want to read, and then we'll have small. Hey now, <laughs> just keep. When's the Super Bowl? Let's schedule the next one for the Super Bowl. No, we have, yeah. yeah, we have to schedule them on days that there are big sporting events. <laughs> As a Scottish person, I was very happy to have something that would keep me away from any news about uh, yeah. the English. Uh, I assume you want Italy to win, then. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. So you, Carter, you're. Uh, I'm not going to say fan. it's right next to me going on right now. So yeah, <laughs> Carter, you're an Argentina fan, obviously. Uh, you know what? I actually like both Argentina and Brazil, so it was a toss up. But I think Messi needed the win. Uh, I think it yeah. was good for Argentina, and I'm I'm happy they won. Uh, and frankly, Brazil did not play well yesterday, so they deserved to lose. So uh, I'm not. I don't get super excited about a particular team. So. But I do like but you both, have the shirt though. Both them. You have the shirt. Yeah, I got a couple Argentina jerseys, and I actually have a Brazil jersey. I, I guess I could have worn oh. too, but oh, okay. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, all right. Um, I just want to I, say thank you for allowing me to be here. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks for joining us. And thank you to yeah. everybody who joined in the live chat, not on camera, but in the chat. We were checking you out. Yeah. All yeah, right. Thanks for organizing this one because I had this book for ages and finally got around to reading it. So that was great. Yeah, I'm glad that I finally read it as well. It was it was one of those books that, like I said earlier, just knew nothing about, and now I really I'm a fan. So maybe I'll read it again in the future. It's a it's a great book. So, isn't there? All a right, part well, two? thank you, everyone. Yeah, there is a part two. I've heard that was written recent. I mean, he died, well, you know, a couple decades ago, I think. But like, it was yeah. written what more, much more recently. Um, but yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> We will uh, catch you tomorrow, right? For, oh, and tomorrow morning, uh, we're there's a there's a episode that Carrie and I filmed on Saturday, which we wanted to put out on Saturday, but didn't happen, and we're not putting it out today because of uh, timing and there's book club going on. But there's another episode tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Pacific time that's premiering, so you can check that out if you're interested in CRT and schools and that kind of crap. Um, so. Uh, and see SPLC. that, and otherwise, yeah, and otherwise, we will see you uh, for Coffee Every Break tomorrow. So, thanks everyone. I really appreciate you guys joining. Let's see Hard if we can you. roll the credits. <laughs>
and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.